We're here with Alec Kuros today, who's in Regina, Canada. And why don't you uh, introduce yourself, Alec, and we'll get we'll get on with it. Sure. Hi, Howard. Uh, my name is Alec Kuros. I'm a, a professor of educational technology and media at the University of Regina. I've been here about uh, about 13 years, uh, and I guess my most recent work, uh, probably in the last oh, six or seven years, well, actually a bit more than that, uh, is looking at social networks in teaching and learning. So that's uh, you know connected learning, network learning, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the idea that uh, networks matter in education, and they're probably one of the most important um, concepts, I think, uh, in, in looking at teaching and learning in the 21st century. So uh, what do you mean by visualizing open network learning? Um, you know, just getting, a, I, I mean, I wrote a post a while back, uh, I think um, you've read it, uh, the idea that um, that we, we, we really need to get a sense of what our networks look like and how they uh, work together to allow us, you know, connections. I mean, the connectivist Pro, um, uh, the connectivist problem that George Siemens raises in his theory of connectivism um, and, and what a lot of other people have created around personal learning networks or personal learning environments, whatever way you want to look at it. Um, in visualizing networks, in network learning, I think the idea that um, it's important for us to get a sense of, first of all, um, the tools around us. And, and in my dissertation in 2006, I developed a, a little networked um, uh, network teacher visualization, which I've adapted to, and many other people have adapted around. Um, rather than network teacher, network learner, I think those things go hand in hand. But first of all, really understanding all of the different types of tools that we can be connected to, whether they're microblogging tools, um, social networking services, uh, whether it's even IRC communities or, or if you look, look back at some of the more uh, classic internet communities. But all of these tools, I guess, in some way mediate connections. Um, the thing that I was probably a bit naive back in the day, and maybe, maybe I wasn't naive, I just wasn't ready to embrace at the time, was just how important that, again, it's not just about the tools, but moving in towards how these tools mediate connections and and that really the people behind those tools are the most important. Um, I had the wonderful chance of uh, being at my dean's retirement last night and one of the things that he talked about, he talked about walking through the field. Um, he had a farm when he grew up and he had all of these different buildings around this farm and he goes back now today and all those all those buildings, when he walks, it, he doesn't even own the the, the farm anymore. Um, but all of those buildings are down, and that playground of his youth is totally gone. All the barn and the, you know, the, uh, there was probably he said about half a dozen different buildings, and all those things are gone. But when he digs through the earth, he'll find things like perfume that he remembers women putting on, and and things that you'd put on your uh, on your heel so that your heel wouldn't rub off, and different things that he kind of buried in the dirt. And he asked the question, sort of, what endures? And I think that's one of the most important questions that we ask ourselves, is what endures beyond, you know, when Facebook and MySpace and those things dissipate, when they're gone and they're replaced with something else down the road? The human connection, I think, is one of the most important pieces. So the tools will come and go, but really the, the idea that relationships matter more than anything, I think, uh, is really incredibly important. And, and the question we should be asking around all of the networks and all the implementations of software that we put in is we need to focus on what we think will endure in the future. And I think that's really a big part of, I think, of, of, uh, of visualizing networks and really focusing not on what connects us, but the connections themselves. Well, what kind of suggestions do you have for educators and students who are just starting out about making those connections? I, know, I, I think your, your emphasis on making the, the connection is so central because I think with, without further instruction, a lot of people think, well, I'll, I'll get a lot of Facebook friends and, and uh, I'll follow a lot of people on Facebook, right. on, on Twitter. And, and it's not really about the numbers, as I'm hearing you say it. It's, it's about the connections. How do you do that? Well, you know, there's, so there's a number of different ways to read um, social network data. And, and, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there that allow to, you know, so if I decided to find a list out there that says the top 50 educators to follow on Twitter or whatever. You, you, you can easily subscribe to those people. Then you use like a paper lead tool to aggregate all that data. Then you've got a daily newspaper. You don't even have to go out and connect. 
Now, that's one way of certainly retrieving and, and getting some of the most important data of the day. But until you actually connect to one of these people, like doing what we're doing here, to have that memorable moment where you actually have a conversation and dialogue, if those tools no longer exist in a couple of years, I'll remember that I had a conversation with Howard. And I think that's what our students have to do is go beyond that actual connection. Go to a place that you, you, you've, you've, bought, you've, you've built a relationship that you are willing to find another tool to connect to that person. If that falls apart, you're going to say, I wonder where Howard is today. You know, he's, you know, Twitter's gone. I remember we used to contact on Twitter or Skype. But to build that connection that you would feel comfortable enough having a coffee with a person or talking deeply about their students or your students or so on. And I think that's incredibly important is that we can use tools for that data gathering, that social, that social data synopsis and, and um, aggregation and those sort of things. But this one-to-one -one piece, the, the Google Hangouts that I know a lot of my colleagues are using where they'll just spend time in t uh, together. DS-106, I mean, th those radio connections, I know that DS-106 is a thing, but it's much more than a thing as in radio. It's, it's a community. It's a, it's, a, it's a vibrant community of people who have connected online and who spend time face-to-face -face now because of those online connections. And I think that's so central to this. So with my students, I mean... And I could step back a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've done in my class, and, I've, and I was inspired by Dean Cheresky in this, is um, something called the learning project. So students will um, seek out a meaningful question, something that they want to learn online. So in, in a lot of cases, they, they go to things like uh, musical instruments. I had one student create mucklucks because it was part of her cultural background and she had never had a chance to do this. Um, you know, so often artistic or musical things, but really to me, it's any question worth answering. And so what they'll do is they'll, um, they'll form network connections. Of course, they'll read the internet in a more consumption model, but they'll also form internet connections, and they will find ways to learn these things, whether it's on YouTube or whatever else, a multitude of resources and tools. Uh, but at, at some point, they actually what often happens in these uh, in, in these projects is students will actually spend some time face to face so the person who um, wanted to research mucklucks she actually found an aboriginal elder and she spent time with that person learning the craft from that person but the internet mediated that connection and that was interesting and part of that project again is also retelling that story how did i do this sharing what you've done and i think the, the telling process is so much important in terms of the teaching process. So reversing those, what's more central, learning to become a teacher, learning to be a teacher, I think is important. So um, reversing the priority of those two intertwined um, activities, I think is really important. So primarily I want learners, really strong learners in my class, and those people will be the great teachers. Uh, and I think being, making your learning visible is incredible. Um, and that's one of the things that Dean Cheresky and myself, asking those questions, we asked two major questions in our class. How are you making learning visible? And how are you contributing to the learning of others? And I think those two questions are central to anyone learning in the digital age. You had a great exercise about making learning visible that, you know, like I think uh, the, the best stuff is so simple when you see it that you yeah. think, well, why didn't I think of that? And, I, and uh, why don't you just share that? Because I think it's so useful. So uh, which one are you referring uh, to? This is one where you're going to ask your students to learn a skill, a concept, yeah. or idea. And that's the learning project I was just discussing right now. I mean, learning, creating mucklucks, creating... Oh, I think you may be t talking about something slightly different. There's, there's also something called... Uh, it's, sort of, it's, um, it's, it's a summary of learning which I think may be a little bit different. So the, there is the learning project, which people just basically decide to, to learn anything and then share that learning online. But I also do something called a summary of learning. So at the end of the class, at the end of the course that they take with me, they do a summary of learning. Um, I've had some really interesting ones. Uh, one I can share with you is a guy by the name of Matt Bresciani. And so what he did was um, he actually created a Mario Brothers styled sort of video game, which was really, really cool. Um, and he basically used Mario Brothers, like the game, as a way to actually uh, share how he learned during the class. So that was his mode. I mean, he used video gaming, and then he actually created screenshots, every single screenshot. Like, he created a video game animation using Mario Brothers, uh, and 
And then in it, he basically showed all the connections that he made in class. Like he showed, you know, when he was bouncing up on the bricks, he'd actually show these little flashes of all the people he connected to, which was really neat. Um, but what was more important about that, he created this, you know, 45 second animation, which was really a lot of work. And then he goes in right away and he decides to um, explain how he did it. You know, like this is what, first of all, this is what everything meant in this video. So he slowed it down, showed everything, every symbol that he used in that video. So it was really good. And then he created another blog post that says, okay, you want to know how I did this? This is how I did it. So not only here's my learning, here's my, what my learning meant, and this is how I perform my learning. So it really is deep in terms of anyone else who wanted to create something like that. Um, and so that was in another project. So, so the two, you know, the three central projects in one of the courses I teach, the uh, undergraduate course I teach, is number one, creating a network. That was sort of their, their big project. So with that, they blog, they try to get comments. And I think one of the most important things is that they, they comment on others. They connect on Twitter, they use hashtags and so on. So that's a big thing. Uh, the learning project, as I mentioned before, is the idea that they will learn anything, but they have to share their learning online. Um, but they also have to sort of document their learning as well. And then that final thing is at the end of the class, they do something called a summary of learning, which again, uh, summarizes all the learning that they did in the class or selected learning that they want to talk about. But um, again, it all comes down to the idea that we want to make your, your learning visible. Um, and of course, a lot of the learning that you do in the class is um, because of or due to the network connections that you create. You know, I love the fact that, that we've been talking for, what, 10 minutes now, and we've used the <laughs> word learning a hundred times, and I don't think the word education has come in once. And I think that's a good idea, it's because it's, you know, we, in education, we expect people to spend all day learning, yeah. and it's surprising that, not, that so little time is spent reflecting on, okay, so what does that mean to you? So thanks, thanks for making that, that visible, Alec. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the time to talk about this. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Howard. <laughs>